Welcome to Lunchbox Sessions, bite-sized industrial training. Hello, this is Carl from lunchboxsessions.com and welcome back to part two on the pressure compensated flow control. In part one, we introduced the motor and the brake shoe brick stacker and our objective with the 500 RPMs. We covered the purpose of the pressure gauge that is here to the right of the flow control and how it is reading only our load pressure at the motor. We talked about how if you want to reduce the flow to an actuator such as a motor, when you have an oversized source such as a variable displacement pressure compensated pump, that you may need an adjustable orifice to limit how many liters per minute or gallons per minute are passed through to the actuator. We also covered in part one about why we have this 2000 PSI pressure on the inlet. That's thanks to our source. Perhaps a gear pump and a relief valve that is oversized a little bit, or it could be a slightly oversized pressure compensated piston pump. So that's our inlet pressure. And then we just briefly introduced the idea that even though we had different resistances on our hydraulic motor, I've just added two bricks to take us to 1400 PSI, we introduced the concept that in a valve such as this one with that pressure compensator spool, that even with some pretty wide variances in load pressure there at the motor, the RPMs are only changing a few percent. That's quite amazing. Because if this flow control only featured a needle valve, which you can certainly acquire for an hydraulic system, it's a common device and it would only include the part of the symbol that you see lit up in green in the lower left, that variable orifice part of the symbol, it would not include that extra arrowhead further to the right. Without that pressure compensator, wild changes in load pressure at the motor would result in a much greater variance of flow leaving the valve. And we would see much wider swings in our actuator speed. So something is happening here. We see that pressure compensator spool moving back and forth inside the valve. It seems to know how to respond to the circumstances of changing load pressure. Let's add one brick to the stack and take our load pressure from 1000 up to 1200. That load pressure passes through an opening here called the load sensing passage and acts on the piston surface to the right on our compensator spool. And somehow that action together with the spring results in a pressure that precedes our control orifice by only about 100 PSI. Now, watch what happens to this gauge when I add another brick to the stack. I'm going to increase our brick stacker pressure to 1400 PSI and we notice that somehow this gauge automatically reports a new pressure that is miraculously only 100 PSI higher than the load pressure. That's interesting because it means that our pressure differential from the load pressure of 1400 PSI to the pressure preceding the adjustable orifice is always about the same. It's pretty close to around 100 PSI. Well, that's happening because of our 1400 PSI entering in to the load sensing passage and having some help from a spring. Can you guess at what the equivalent PSI value is of this spring? You'd be quite correct to guess that that spring has an equivalent force of about 100 PSI. So 1400 plus about a 100 PSI boost from that spring has set us up with a pressure preceding our control orifice, our variable orifice, the needle valve, has setting us up with a pressure that is 100 PSI higher than what we see at the brick stacker, our true load pressure. Let's take some bricks off the stack and see what happens. 
I'm down to 1200 on the brick stacker and we see pretty close to 1300 preceding the needle valve. I'm down to 1000 on the brick stacker and we see 1100 preceding the needle valve. We'll drop to 800 on the brick stacker and we see 900 preceding the needle valve. Well, the beauty of a locked in delta P, a locked in differential value between the inlet and the outlet just before and after the needle valve, if we can lock in that delta P, that pressure differential, our flow rate passing to the motor will be held quite consistent. And wouldn't you know, our motor speed is also being held at 500 RPMs. That's quite an amazing feat for a valve that only has mechanical elements inside. If we wanted any tighter control over RPMs than this, we would have to deploy some very sophisticated process control schemes with advanced instrumentation and electronics. So this is pretty good. So that's it for part two. That looked at how the pressure compensated flow control reacts to changes in the load pressure. When you come back for part three, we'll look at exactly what happens over here where our pressure is transitioning from red to yellow and what the importance is of this inlet orifice. That's it for this time. Thanks for watching. We have hundreds of interactive resources like this live schematic, so you can try out your wild ideas without blowing anything up. Get started at lunchboxsessions.com.